Now we have talk seven by Dr. Bhartati Dahari, ISC Bangalore on Big Data in Human Genetics and Genomics Research. Dr. Bhartati Dahari is at the Center for Brain Research. Bhartati earned her PhD at the Bose Institute, Kolkata, in 2011, working at the Center of Excellence in Bioinformatics. She was a, doc a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Michigan Medical School. Johnny affiliated with the Department of Internal Medicine and Department of Computational Medicine and Bioinformatics. On behalf of Rajagiri School of Engineering and Technology and CETA, I welcome Dr. Bhattati Kahari for the session. Over to you, Madam. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. And I'm glad that uh, Professor Vinod Kumar gave me this opportunity today to show some of our work. Uh, I'll just share my screen. Uh, my screen is visible, right? Uh, yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'll just go ahead with the talk. Uh, uh, one thing is that I would just like to, uh, akin to the title, I would just like to present some examples from our work over the years and why data means uh, something really crucial in human uh, genetics and genomics research and how it can ultimately help in the uh, healthcare uh, of our population. So starting here, yeah, just give me one moment. Yes, so something that we uh, kind of uh, conveniently remember but forget is that uh, our uh, genetic makeup determines to a great extent who we are. And it's not just about height or uh, skin color, but something really um, complex like uh, having our uh, susceptibilities to diseases, like what is our predisposition to having uh, normal glucose absorption in blood uh, to versus something which is known as insulin resistance and that leads to the development of type 2 diabetes and other downstream abnormalities. Similarly, for the case of neurodegeneration also, some people just age without any difficulty uh, in uh, memory and uh, uh, other day-to-day -day activities. But for others, we see that uh, neurodegeneration is a big uh, health issue and that puts a great burden on the individual as well as their caregivers and family members. So all this to a great extent is determined by our genetic makeup. And this is something my lab is dedicated to studying. And we will uh, give some examples on how, uh, uh, how we deal that with statistical and computational analysis of the genomic data. So when we say that uh, something is related to genetics, what people usually think is that there is a single gene, right? So maybe uh, our genome is very big, though, so there is just one locus. And what happens is that uh, something is uh, going wrong in that locus, uh, like for biologists, like how biologists will say that, oh, there is a mutation in the gene, so it leads to a faulty protein, and that leads to a disease. So that is kind of very much hypothesis driven, where we have a mutant and they understand the key to our understanding of gene, uh, they hold the key to our understanding of gene function. So what we see is that there is some problem in uh, insulin resistance, insulin secretion, and we see that, okay, if there are individuals in the population who carry this particular mutant, which has been discovered from some animal studies, uh, we see that, okay, those individuals are at a higher predisposition to having type 2 diabetes. However, not all the time is this 
uh, the conditions that I'm going to talk about today, they are uh, caused due to just one genetic locus or one gene mutation. They, they are something different because these kinds of diseases like Alzheimer's disease or type 2 diabetes or cardiovascular disease, these are called complex diseases. Why? Because the, our susceptibility to these diseases are determined by multiple genetic loci who exert their effect on the population in connection with environmental factors. For example, we may have uh, 20 different loci that are <coughs> that are uh, correlated with a higher risk of type 2 diabetes. And in addition to that, some of them can be uh, can can be more correlated with sugar intake, while the others may be not. So that actually increases the complexity of the situation. And these diseases are called complex disease susceptibilities. Now, why study DNA? Because DNA is essentially the barcode, right, the, of who we are. So uh, DNA is basically the most subtle, elegant, and complex instruction manual for all forms of life on Earth. But it is not so easy to study that also because uh, I mean, we know that there are about uh, 30 trillion cells in our body. And if we stretch the DNA from any on one of our cells, uh, it would be like six feet long, okay, for both the strands together. So consider 30 trillion cells and the resulting length would be 67 billion miles, which is like hundreds and thousands of round trips to the moon and back from earth. So you can imagine that if we have to read the component and the sequence in which the nucleotides are arranged in the DNA to understand a disease, it's a huge data that we are talking about. And that is essentially what we do day in and day out. <coughs> Excuse me. So how do we study this instruction manual for humans? And do we need to study different populations and different individuals? We can always say that, oh, I had a mice, uh, a mice study, and then I studied five different, uh, uh, under five different conditions, I, see, I had my mice, and I studied uh, them from a disease perspective. I fed them uh, diet A, I fed them diet B, and I noticed how much they are gaining weight and all that. There are very, uh, very um, significant differences to studying humans. First of all, those research cannot always be translated to humans. There is, there are many intermediate steps, and then humans as a whole, as I will come to my uh, following slides, as a whole we differ a lot. So, for example, uh, we carry 1.2 billion bases in the entire, uh, 3.2 billion bases of nucleotides in the entire genome, right? And if any two humans differ by only of 0.1% or 0.2%, that itself is a huge number. So those differences are very crucial. And when we say that we are studying the instruction manual, aka the DNA for us humans, we are basically studying how we differ from each other and what those differences mean in terms of our disease susceptibilities or any external characteristic or trait which is heritable, like height. Okay, now I will go back one step as I was talking about a single gene disorder, right? So this is a, a schematic representation. I thought that uh, maybe it, it might help uh, this audience to understand where uh, two homologous chromosomes and we have two alleles, okay? Let's say this is an example case uh, of the gene for eye color where the allele is either brown or blue. <coughs> and one is inherited from the mother and the other one is inherited from the father. Now we say that the brown allele, the big A is dominant and the blue allele is recessive, which is the small A. So definitely then if the child inherits two different alleles, which we call as heterozygous in our genetics parlance, they will have 
brown eyes because brown is the dominant eye color in this particular scenario. If a child inherits both the small a's, he or she is a homozygous for the blue, which is the recessive, and then that child will express the blue eye color. And then, of course, the dominant brown will be expressed by anyone homozygous for big A. Now, as I was talking about a single gene variant, what happens is that when we consider some disease, let's say disease X, okay, and want to know that, okay, I know a gene, a mutation. So what I will do in order to understand the penetration of that disease in the population, for me, it is just sufficient that I will count the number of homozygous, let's say disease not causing individuals, then the heterozygous ones who are the carriers, and then the homozygous small a, let's say, which is the disease causing ones, right? <clears throat> so I'm using this particular point here to make a case for something as benign as eye color, as well as something as counting the alleles for disease propensities. So if I see that this, there are individuals, 10 individuals, who have AA, who are supposed to have the disease, they will have the disease because it is a single gene, single mutation co converting to disease phenotype example, right? But when there are multitudes of such loci across the genome, the situation is quite a bit different in studying our disease susceptibilities. <coughs> Excuse me. So what do we mean by genetic makeup in a population? Because then what we have to study in order to develop a hypothesis-free approach, because we don't know any more single mutant that I should be focused on studying. So now I have to scan the genomes of each and every individual in my study set. Now, let's say that these are 10 individuals in a certain population, and I'm looking at a stretch of a DNA, right? So the DNA stretch looks like this. So what you will see here is that majority of them are invariant sites, which is the black ones. Now, some could be variant. For example, here, CT. So some individuals will have C, some individuals will have T. Then here, a few individuals will have G, some of them will have T. Then again, there could be A and G. So these are the variant sites. And it turns out that these individuals due to, the, due to these variants will have different phenotypes with which these variants are associated. Now, you can imagine that in some cases, they will be like 30% and 70%, let's say 30% C and 70% T. Then there can be 40% G and 60% T. Then there can be 10% A and 90% G. Similarly, there can be situations where it becomes so rare, let's say this A becomes so rare that you sample 200, 300, or 1,000 individuals and it occurs only once or twice. So they become very rare. So they have certain connotations to our disease specificities. Now, why do we need to study different populations? That is because in one population, some individuals, if you consider with respect to a reference gold standard, <clears throat> we will see that there are certain variant sites which do not match with the other populations. So there are differences relative to the reference genome. So then what happens is that the genetic variation which refers <clears throat> to these DNA bases they differ from individual to individual within the same species. And this is what I was saying, that they determine our susceptibilities to diseases and other external heritable characteristics. So when we, when we uncover the genetic variations, what do we uncover? We uncover these nucleotides, which are different among the individuals. We also uncover short insertions and deletions. For example, this individual can have an extra uh, segment of DNA which has been inserted. This individual can have uh, these two segments deleted. Then there can be copy number variations where we will see repeats or we will see inversions in DNA 
or like a chunk of one chromosome detaches and attaches itself completely to another chromosome. So all sorts of these kinds of changes occur in our genomes. Not always are they related with severe disease phenotypes. <clears throat> but what we need to know is that such differences, which are the slips and the indels that I am combining insertions and deletions together, I will call them indels from now on, or the short tandem repeats and the copy number variations and all that, they are quite frequent in the genome, especially the single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs. Now, even if 99.9% .9 of the DNA is shared between two individuals, the rest of the 0.1% still means that about three to five million base pairs are different between any two individuals. And that is true for any two individuals you take from anywhere on earth, okay? And the remaining phenotypic variations, when you try to explain uh, the differences in disease susceptibilities are due to environmental differences, okay? Now, health research today is facilitated to a great extent by genomics. I'll tell you why. What we want to know is that when we have knowledge <clears throat> of genetic variants in the population, so we want to know that, okay, so these are the individuals. Remember, I was showing you the stretches of DNA, right? So if there are three or four individuals out of my sample of 100, who share certain stretches of the genome and they both seem to have diabetes, right? So that allows us to more efficiently pinpoint where in the genome and potentially why these disorders may occur. So this is where our statistical skills come into play. <clears throat> we also find common patterns between people's DNA and traits or the disease. For example, uh, two people can have all the characteristics in the genome that both of them will have diabetes. In addition to that, one of them could be having some other disease signatures. And you know, diabetes can lead to later kidney disease and all that, right? So we also study that this metabolic disorder, which is diabetes, is it predisposing these individuals to something uh, more uh, lethal in uh, the next stages of the life, like chronic kidney disease or Alzheimer's disease. It may turn out that although these two individuals had the same signatures of diabetes, basically one of them could end up with kidney disease, the other would not. It can also mean that one of them is more uh, predisposed towards having Alzheimer's, but the other individual is not. So these are the things that we study by statistical associations and machine learning approaches. We can also try to find the underlying genetic factors for certain diseases by looking for genetic patterns among people with similar medical issues. <clears throat> for example, if they are more at risk and obviously, we can cluster the genes by their expressions in relevant cells and tissues and find the connectivity between the genotypic and the phenotypic patterns. So what happens now is that with increasing complexity in genomic data, we are actually turning to machine learning and uh, more sophisticated uh, statistical uh, learning for uh, finding the patterns which would be crucial for healthcare. So we can accurately identify genetic disorders right now. We can even predict the cancer trajectories in individual patients. We can, of course, distinguish something. This is really common that we do, that uh, we distinguish the disease causing and the benign mutations. As I told you that not all changes lead to diseases. And the, so it is very important to distinguish the disease causing and the benign mutations in the newly sequenced genomes. So for that, what we do is that our training data forms the already sequenced genomes <clears throat> and our testing data set is the newly sequenced genomes. 
Now, we have all been hearing, especially after the Nobel Prize a couple of years back about CRISPR-Cas, right? That how this is gene editing and this is going to eradicate all uh, the diseases from human gene pool. Now, will it really work? Yes, there is a CRISPR knockout database, but a lot of it is prediction and not everything has been functionally tested and definitely not in humans. So in order to improve the prediction power of the results that these gene editing tools like CRISPR can have, we can use the statistical learning. So these are the all sorts of big data that I'm talking about. Now, when did all this start? Sort of in 2011, when there was this landmark announcement that the draft human genome sequence <coughs> has been completed. Now, fast forward 20 years, we are at a position right now where we generate, as I will show you, the amount that each lab can generate who are dedicated to human genomics research. And in the next decade or so, we will be at a scale of exabytes of data, which is 10 to the power 18 bytes. And this is just only genomics data. I'm not even talking about that these human beings for whom we are having the genomics data, we also have other parameters. Yes, that is definitely not in the scale of petabytes or exabytes, but they are, that data is also huge. For example, these individuals, a subset of them could have MRI imaging data. They can have all their electronic health records. So we are practically swimming in data right now being genomics researchers. But what that also brings as a challenge is that we need to develop and make educated employment of sophisticated statistical and computational methods to improve our understanding of the patterns. And most of the time it is hidden because the patterns are not obvious in this large scale of data for the complex genomics data sets from basic and clinical research projects. <clears throat> So how health research today is facilitated by genomics and other biological big data. So what are the types of data, the big data in biomedicine? So it can be genomics, it can be our metabolic profile, our um, gene expression profile, which is the transcriptomics or RNA-seq data, uh, the environmental factors, our social connections, because this is a big area uh, especially when we want to study neurodegenerative conditions like Alzheimer's, then our health history and records, the medications that we take, because if I am studying a subset of people who are at risk for dyslipidemia, I do have to take into account if they are already on a lipid lowering medications. And uh, a very another crucial aspect is our behavior. So environment, like if we live in a pesticide-free environment or if we are eating uh, food laden with pesticides and if we exercise, that is one part of our behavior. So all this together forms the big data in biomedicine. Then we develop integrated <coughs> analysis pipeline for this multi-omics analysis, which is transcriptomics, metabolomics, lipidomics, genomics. And then we meta-analyze results from small cohorts, keeping certain conditions on which we can actually meta-analyze in mind. And we do the co-expression analysis sometimes for genetic studies. For example, if we are looking for uh, two diseases which can originate or which can have relevance to the same tissue, let's say liver, right? So uh, if I'm looking for glycogen storage disease as well as for uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, I, I both for both, I will look into the liver. And uh, transcriptomics analysis, along with the genomics analysis of those individuals focused on the liver tissue, that is co-expression analysis. And obviously, everything is facilitated by statistics and to some extent, machine learning. And then we need to follow the ethical regulation, sharing of data sets, funding, of course, the most important thing. We foster collaborations with biologists and uh, clinicians, 
And then what we try to do is that we try to have inferences which is informed from the genetic makeup of our study individuals so that it will help us in developing better therapeutic targets and actually uh, facilitate the roadmap of healthcare in our country and our population. <coughs> so we do not co always completely channel challenge but definitely their standard care has been that very rarely do we uh, treat uh, patients keeping in mind their uh, susceptibilities to certain diseases. And right now, at least some, uh, some developments have been made in the past uh, couple of years that right now the situation is that you can probably just carry a chip in your necklace, which will tell you that okay, these are my, uh, this is my uh, results from my whole genome sequencing. So treat me according to that. And I think that is uh, going to become a reality sometime in the future, even if not too soon. So what we want to establish as a common practice is that information from WGS, from which we establish the risk scores for subsets or entire populations for various diseases, will allow a doctor to predict whether an individual is at risk of developing certain diseases in the future. And thus he or she can treat the patient based on their unique genetic makeup. <clears throat> so how do we do this? We can have array-wide studies, which takes care of about 900,000 markers in the genome. But remember that is less than even 1% of the genome because we have all 6 billion A, C, Gs and Ts, which is the whole genome sequencing. Now, obviously this is not something to scale because it is not uh, quite feasible also to show something to scale of 900,000 to 6 billion. So what happens is that we employ both these technologies. We analyze data from both these technologies and try to arrive at a middle ground. Now, why do we need this is that, or what we uncover is that the complex traits that I was telling you, which is intricately linked to our human health in a population, in a real human population, they are governed by the overall composition of the variants, right? And when I say the architecture of the trait, what I mean is that what are the alleles, what are their frequencies, what is the effect size of influencing particular disease traits, and how do we factor in the environmental influences? So that we will have implications for uncovering these genetic factors in the Indian population. <coughs> now, one thing that is extremely important is the rare variations. Usually the rare variations are population specific, meaning that we find something in certain ethnic groups in the country or in India as overall, we may not find it randomly by chance in any other population across the world. So it is extremely important that we identify these rare variations in our population so that that can serve as a screening database for the disease conditions. Now coming to data, what we find is that uh, this is an equipment that we have here for genome sequencing, full genome sequencing, which is the Illumina Nova Seq 6000. And what we generate is that for every 24 samples pooled together, we have about 1.5 terabytes of data. But this data is not readable in any format. We have to tease them out for every individual belonging to each of these lanes that is used as a consumable. On this, we load the DNA samples, right? So what it actually comprises is about 20 to 30 billions of reads in this each experimental run of NovaSeq. So this is my DNA reads and I have to tear them, assemble them, tear them apart, again assemble them if I tell it from a non-genomics perspective to understand what is the sequence of these organisms. And 
you know, 24 samples do not make much sense. We usually have to do it for thousands and thousands of samples. <laughs> so that brings us to the formal thing about genomic big data. Number one is variety. So number two is volume. And then the third one is, of course, velocity. So when I talk about variety, as I told you that in addition to health records, medications, we want to know the sequence of the DNA, which is the whole genome sequence, the RNA, microarray, the expression data sets, and the metabolomics. And of course, the environmental factors and behavior are recorded. In terms of volume, as I said, that 24 human samples WGS amounts to, this is the raw data, 1.5 terabytes. So it can expand to 70 terabytes in analytical stages. This and also this data makes sense in large cohorts of tens of thousands because you want to make population specific inferences. We are not looking at single genes anymore. So if we have to make inference about our 1.3 billion population, we at least need 10,000, 20,000 data with appropriate representation from across the country. So you can imagine where this amounts to, right? Similarly, with velocity, in one week, just this one sequencer can sequence 200 human samples, which means that that is about 14 petabyte in analytical data handling. So this analysis is basically done in our ISC supercomputer and the CBR, uh, which is my department, the high performance computing, which can have 340 teraflops system requirements in a week. So this is the big data that I am talking about we are handling. So what do we get from this, right? <clears throat> so now you will notice that our panels have changed. The left goes to right, the right goes to left. Why? Because now we are talking from population genomics to treatment. So right now with this big data, we are agnostic of any biased hypothesis. Basically, we are now generating hypothesis to identify new and unanticipated genes, which will expand the existing view of biology and the pathophysiology of the disease that we are interested in studying. So when we, when we have the genome sequences, we have the variants, right? So how do we associate that with a disease? Remember when I was talking about uh, one gene, one mutation, one protein disturbance, what was I saying? That you have certain number of homozygous individuals who do not have the mutation, certain number of homozygous individuals who have the mutation, that means they are at the greatest risks. And then in the middle, the heterozygous carriers who may not exhibit symptoms of the disease, but they are the carriers for the disease. But that is single chain, single mutation. <coughs> but when we do association at a genome-wide level, what we take is that we try to find what are the odds of having the disease given a particular SNP genotype. And we do that in absence of covariates as well as in presence of covariates. So this can be a case control study, which means that I can, let's say if I'm studying Alzheimer's disease, so I can have uh, 10,000 Alzheimer's disease patients and 50,000 controls age and gender matched from the same population group, preferably where I will try to find that what are the odds that an individual who belongs to the case category is showing increased frequency of the disease allele. Is that randomly happening or is there a significance associated with it? And this is done by logistic regression. Now, similarly, let's say that we are looking at something like a quantitative trait, like fasting blood sugar, which is an indication of the person could be pre-diabetic, diabetic, or completely healthy in terms of glycemic uh, metabolism, right? <clears throat> so we can have uh, a vector of covariates that will take care. Here also, of course, we can add a vector of covariates and our uh, we will have uh, the phenotype as the outcome. And then we will have the FX size for the recessive uh, conditions like people who can have this phenotype 
even with the recessive combinations of those alleles. And then the population increase in the mean phenotype, which is the main effect size that we are looking for, for each of the genotypes. So we will sum it over any combination of genotypes, and then we sum the effect sizes and try to find what is the penetrance of this particular phenotype in the population given this effect size that we have determined from the alleles. So it will be given by the effect size and the allele frequencies. And while we are doing that, we have already taken into account the relevant covariates like age, gender, ethnicity, education level, if we are studying cognition, um, if you are studying diabetes, if the person is already on metfor metformin, if we are studying uh, lipid disorders, if the person is already on statins, so those are our relevant covariates. So what do we get from a GWAS? So these are basically our signals. GWAS, the genome-wide association study that I was telling you. <clears throat> so this is our p-value of association for the variants in or near these genes. Uh, so after Bonferroni correction, our uh, association uh, p-value that should be considered as a threshold for significance is five times 10 to the minus eight. And we see that some of the association signals are very, very significant. And remember, this has been obtained from 350,000 individuals in the European population. So what we get is that along the genome, what are the loci? And these are these like consistent uh, uh, towers that are coming up, which is a Manhattan plot. This tell us that this is a replicable signal. So this is not a false positive or anything like that, okay? So this is the association signal that a variant in the in or near GRP gene is associated with human body mass index. Similarly, we have all these other associations. Now, this would have been impossible if we would have not been dealing with big data from all uh, from this enormous number of individuals. <clears throat> now, when I was uh, showing you the genetic variants at loci, I was uh, showing the variants, right? What can happen is that sometimes if the variants are in very close vicinity, they are not independent of each other. So means that you can tag one of them, which will already capture the effects from the two others. That is kind of assumed as a default. But we have seen in recent times that there can be independent signals. So this is one of the targets which is now being considered for a lowering BMI in the European population, where we see that there is a top hit from the association results, but two other are independent hits. And why is this important is because this genetic makeup that you are seeing as the background genetic makeup in the individuals could differ between Europeans and us Indians. It can very well happen that as Indians, we will uncover this one as the predominant signal rather than this one as the predominant signal for BMI. So if I'm going to treat Indians based on the knowledge of this from Europeans, I am going to be faulty. So I have to have knowledge of each of the variations in the genome of our individuals and go and find independent hits to disease associations. So that result that I was showing, <clears throat> how is it important is because we have seen that for an average height individual, now this study was done in half a million individuals in the UK, that for an average height individual, the changing of one allele to other is equivalent to 2.5 kg lower body weight. And that 2.5 kg may not seem a lot, but this amount of body weight is actually very significant when we consider the downstream effects of being overweight or obese, which is like having diabetes or chronic kidney disease or developing neurodegeneration in late life. 
So this is where our studies become significant to human populations directly just by big data analysis. We also try to find by appropriate training and testing <coughs> sets that if our variant is the causative variant, because correlation does not always lead to causation, which this audience is very much educated. I don't even need to tell them. So uh, then we really need to find that what is the causative agent. Again, for that, we need to scan the whole genome sequences of these individuals. Now, is this information actionable? That is found by data mining from the curated genetic variants and in the context of the genetic makeup of the background genetic makeup of the population to find clinical implications in our population or any other population from the already existing data. Now, another uh, highlight of our lab, apart from the association studies that we do in uh, worldwide populations and Indian populations, is that Center for Brain Research is the coordinating center, the national coordinator for the Pan-Indian Project Genome India, which <coughs> is aimed to identify genetic variations and detect genetic basis of diseases through whole genome sequencing of representative populations across India. So as representation in the first phase, we have about 100 population subgroups from all over the country, and they make up the 10,000 individuals in our data set. Now, why was this needed? First of all, our population is huge. We are the second largest, anytime going to be the first largest in the world. We have very well defined more than four and a half thousand ethnic groups who are extremely distinct from one another. In addition to that, Indians have unique social classifications where endogamous marriage practices have been rampant for several thousand years, right? And although we might feel that, oh, we can identify two different individuals from two different ethnic groups because they speak the different languages, that is not always true because it has been shown that languages evolve much faster than genes. So we really need to check the genetic makeup. So what we see is that <clears throat> the present day Indian genetic makeup or architecture reflects all these points. So a person from this uh, uh, group, the red group, could be having some alleles which will predispose him or her to Alzheimer's, which is not true for this group and maybe semi-true for this group. So that's why it is extremely important to have population representation and that can be done by tens and uh, thousands, tens and tens and thousands of individuals from our population. So what we can ultimately do is that what we are currently doing basically is we are increasing the efficiency in mapping the disease loci. And we need to catalog the rare and the common alleles by whole genome sequencing. Why is that needed is that I want to show you a little <coughs> uh, example from one of our works is that this is the effect, the y-axis gives you the effect versus the x-axis, which gives you the effect allele frequency, means the risk allele for increasing BMI, okay? So what you see is that the novel ones are denoted in red. They were not earlier identified. And you know why? Because they were not identified from the previous sample size. We could only identify them after increasing the sample size by twofold because they have lesser frequency. So imagine that if we have to uncover all these disease causing variations in our population, which could be rare, but have great penetrative effect, capable of causing more severity of any disease, we need to go for whole genome sequencing data analysis. Also, what we do is that when we study population-specific genetic studies, we have found that there can be some variants which will in which which 
the variant depending on which allele you are carrying, if you are carrying the T allele or the C allele. So if you carry the C allele, you may be at a risk of cardiovascular disease. But it's no good even if we carry the T allele because with T allele, we will be at a risk of severe liver disease, non-alcoholic. <coughs> so we tease out the effects of these metabolic traits and make predictions based on age to the clinician because it may happen that if someone carries the T allele, the fibrosis could happen at an earlier age compared to the cardiovascular disease. So then we need to know that the individual is carrying the T allele or the C allele because he will be given preventive medication or treatment or intervention depending on which allele he carries. I mean, neither of them are good here, but at least we have an idea of what to, what to expect going five or 10 years from now. So what we are doing then with such kind of data is that how is our genetic makeup as Indians? How do we differ from one another in terms of genetics? Two people may be sitting at the doctor's chamber and yet they too may have so different genetic makeup that they are at risk of completely different disease spectrums. And how do these differences sometimes make us more or less likely to have specific diseases? Now, not all of the time are we completely different. Remember, we share more than 99% of the DNA with any other individual, although we differ at 5 million sites across the genome. So it is very different to understand. So it is very difficult as well as very important to understand that if we have those overlaps, <coughs> extremely sorry for the cough. If we have those overlaps, what does that mean? Does that mean that we are completely identical in terms of disease specificities? Turns out it is not. So I will give you a little bit of glimpse from some of our unpublished results. So if I study about 1,000 Indian individuals, what we uncover is that adding those inter-individual differences, we are at a total of about more than 45 million variations, right? The total number of SNP calls are 41 million, which are the single nucleotide differences. Now, out of these, more than 12, 13 million are completely private, which means it appears only in one sample at a time. So these need to be taken very clear look at with more individuals coming in. What are the total number of indels, uh, the short insertions and deletions? And about a quarter of our uncovered variants, 12 out of 47 million, are completely novel to our population. Now, remember, I was telling that there can be novel as well as overlap SNPs. So what turns out is that in the overlap SNPs, the variant allele frequencies can differ a lot. For example, some European or African can have the same variant, but could be at 0.1% frequency. And we could be at 15% frequency. So because the allele frequency can modulate the effect size of disease specificities, so what happens is that we can be at lesser or greater risk of that particular disease. Now, these novel SNPs, we have to study them very carefully to understand how they can implicate our disease specificities, okay? <clears throat> so what happens is that we also do big data analysis uh, by virtue of machine learning to assign that what are the variants that we have uncovered, what do they have consequences in terms of proteins in the genome. So it turns out that most of the variants are intergenic and 37% are intronic variations, meaning these are not in the coding regions. Out of the coding variants, about 57% cannot induce changes in protein structure, but a whopping 35% can induce changes in protein structure, which is very important because that means it can be lethal and cause diseases. Now, when we are talking about our novel rare and low frequency variants, we see that if we consider the nearby genetic structure and we do uh, proper statistical data uh, analysis approaches, 
I'm not going into the methodological details. What we have found is that the low frequency and the, no and the rare variants, which are completely novel in our population, they could be actually helping us to find map the causal, neurological, and cognitive signals in all world populations, at least 20% of the cases. So this is a huge number, and the number is even huge, more uh, huge for the metabolic conditions. So this is a summary of what we have uncovered from the 1000 genomes. Now, I will just breeze through a little bit when I was talking about the 900,000 markers, remember I told you that we try to arrive at, an, at a middle ground with WGS and the genotyped markers. So what we have designed is that we have designed an imputation panel for genotypes. This is the probabilistic estimation by a Gibbs sampler for our uh, genotypes in the Indian population. What we see is that our panel performs the best, the yellow one, compared to all the other worldwide panels available for all classes of variants. This is extremely important for the rare variants <clears throat> because we have identified now that our panel is accurate for variants present in only about 10 of the 2,500 individuals. So we can accurately estimate the disease specificities. And another marker of accuracy is that the allele frequency also very correctly conforms to that of a South Asian population. So what we can do is that we can make large-scale genome-wide association studies feasible that some results I already showed you. And then we can help understand the genetic basis of disorders. And currently we are developing genetic scores in population subgroups and individuals by which we will be able to predict dispositions. Now, I wanted to show you that how we are still so much underpowered. So for example, if I take two anthropometric traits for body mass index and waist to hip ratio measuring central obesity, we are, I mean, again, to this audience, I do not really need to uh, explain a QQ plot, but you will see that how we are under, uh, underpowered and we really need to add more samples to properly understand the disease specificities and correctly uh, calculate the genetic risk scores. Now, in addition to single gene, uh, single uh, loci and their uh, contribution as a whole, we also try to understand if the loci could be interacting to generate a non-additive effect. So that non-additive or non-linear effect, we have found that it is very much possible. And we are currently identifying that like APOE, which is the biggest genetic risk factor for Alzheimer's, how do other genetic loci interact with APOE in the genetic context to contribute towards neurodegeneration by non-additive genetic effects? So this is one pipeline that we developed for human obesity. And we have found that there is, uh, this correlates very well. <clears throat> this is the genotype combinations, which is uh, significantly contributing towards epistasis or interaction effects in obesity. And they have extremely concerted expression of associated genes. So this is where genomics and transcriptomics are coming together along with the phenotype. And we could pinpoint that these may be the causal genes which are actually contributing to the effect of obesity beyond the additive uh, contributions. Now, I'm not sure if I have time, I may stop here. I just wanted to give you one example uh, of, it is not always the genomic data, it's also the phenotypic data, in this case, the neuropsychological data, uh, by which we measure the cognitive uh, score of individuals, where we applied random forests and Fisher scores to identify that how a subset of neuropsychological tests could be used to correctly predict an individual as Alzheimer's, mild cognitive impairment, or completely cognitively healthy. So these are the details. I'm not going through the methodological details, <clears throat> but I will just show you that how the eight tests compare to all the tests. So these are different um, iterations. And we show that a framework 
of precise classification can be obtained with just one third of the tests, which is 95% accurately predicting the cognitive status of an individual. And these tests span certain regions of cognitive domains so that it becomes important that we do not need to keep on testing each and every domain for the individuals. This is important as a future impact because it will help us in screening in populations so that we can augment the classification and do not have to burden the study subjects with hours and hours of cognitive tests. So I'm very blessed and proud to have my lab members uh, listed uh, on the right side and uh, funding from various agencies of the government of India. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, if there are any questions, happy to take them. Any questions? Hello? Yes. Am I audible, ma'am? Yes, yes. Uh, ma'am, I just want to know, like, uh, uh, if you just want to do any type of research uh, um, and studies in uh, uh, specifically the disease prediction and all, for example, uh, cancer prediction and all, uh, yes. uh, uh, connected with a particular individual, right? So in that case, yes. we need a, a temporal data, right? Often we work on a static data set. So, so right. a, 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 is it possible to do like that? Yes. So what happens with cancer, I did not touch upon cancer in this talk. <clears throat> with cancer, because these are somatic mutations we need uh, to do the in order to study the progression of cancer. So your training data set should have should should have already captured uh, the temporal variability. So yes. you need to keep on doing whole genome sequencing or maybe the tissue specific sequencing if you if you already know, let's say it is pancreatic cancer yes. and you and you are not interested in studying metastasis at all. So you can take uh, pancreatic biopsy uh, tissues and then uh, go for sequencing at intermediate um, uh, like uh, intermediate frequencies. And then you can train your model and then use another data set for your prediction. But yes, with cancer, you need uh, temporal data. But with non-cancerous uh, phenotypes, it is fine. Because our genotypes do not change over time. It's only with cancer that they change. So is such a data available? Yes, 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 it is available. So uh, there, there is this uh, Cancer Genomics Consortium. You can try to visit their page. I believe a lot of data is available. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Any other questions? On behalf of all representatives and participants, I extend my gratitude to Dr. Bratapi Kahari for enlightening us with her talk on Big Data in Human Genetics and Genomics Research. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you again. All parts of pleasure. Yes, thank you, ma'am. All participants, please ensure that you fill the feedback form provided. Now we will have a break for 10 minutes. Paper presentation session will start by 4 10, uh, paper, paper presentation session 3 and 4. will start by 4 10 pm. Participants for paper presentation from C07 to C09, also C14 to C17. Have to remain in the same Zoom meet link. And participants for paper presentation from CP18 to CP21 have to join the other Zoom meet link, which is provided in the schedule of contributed paper presentation. So, all of you please join at 4 10 pm. Thank you.
Hello. Hello. Uh, can you hear me? Hello. 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 Uh, hello. Uh, uh, sir, this is Guru, sir. I'm just checking if my audio is working for tomorrow's talk. Just checking. Is the audio working? Okay, okay, sir. Okay, sir. Okay, sir.
Hello. Hello. Madam, presentation the cup start here, right? Yes, you must start by open. Okay, so contributory paper session, presentation session three starts from here. So uh, the presentation numbers C07 to C09 and C14 to C17, please make sure we. Please note that the presentation time will be 10 minutes for the presentation and plus five minutes for the question and answer session. Please uh, note the time for the presentation. So first presentation will be C07 by Sujit Vibhota, Sumanta Kumar Singh. So are you ready? Hello? I think C07 is absent. Uh, so C08, Mangal. Ah, madam. Ah, sir, uh, can you share your presentation? Uh, just uh, I would I would require five ten minutes more because uh, my timing is the. Uh, okay, okay, it's okay, sir. Uh, so is Supriya Rajendran? Uh, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I'm ready. Okay. So please yes. present presentation. Yes. Is it visible, ma'am? Yes, ma'am. So your time starts now. Okay. Good evening. I'm Supriya Rajendran doing part-time research uh, in Amrita Vishwavidya Pitam, Kochi campus. And my title is on the detailed eccentric sum of graphs and the contributors of the paper and my presentation includes introduction literature review about the graph invariant eccentric distance sum of graphs and about the detour uh, about the topological index detour eccentric sum of graphs the scope of the study and the references Graph theory is a tool for enumeration of chemical compounds and topological index is a numerical quantity associated with the molecular graph G obtained from the corresponding molecular structure. We use to describe some physical, we use this topological indices to describe some physical, chemical and pharmacological properties of molecules and chemical compounds. So in my article, we study the topological index detour eccentric sum of graphs for some classes of graphs. This is some basic ideas. By a graph G, we mean a finite, undirected, without loops and multiple edges. The cardinality of the vertex set, that is the order of the graph is denoted by N, 
and the cardinality of the edge set, that is the size of the graph is denoted by M. By the term distance in a graph, it means the distance between a pair of vertices, which is the length of the shortest path between them. The eccentricity of a vertex is the maximum of the distance of a vertex to all other vertices in the graph. Similarly, detour distance is defined as the length of the longest path between a pair of vertices and the detour eccentricity is the maximum of the detour distance of a vertex to all other vertices in the graph. So graph theory finds its way for applications to structure property and structure activity relationships and the isomer enumerations. J. De Villers and A.T. Balaban gave numerical characterization of chemical structure using topological indices and related descriptors. The study of topological index based on distance started in 1947 when Harold Wiener introduced the Wiener index, which is an aid to determine the boiling point of paraffin. In 2002, Gupta and his co-authors introduced the topological index eccentric distance sum for predicting biological and physical properties. They established that some structure activity and quantitative structure property studies using this parameter were better than the corresponding values obtained by Wiener index. So the notion of this parameter eccentric distance sum is extended to detour eccentric sum and studied. The motivated from the work of these authors, we extend the notion of this uh, uh, topological index, extended distance sum, by considering detour distance instead of distance. Some basic results. In a graph, the, if the detour distance between a pair of vertex is one, then the edge connecting them will be a bridge, and converse is also true. Distance between a pair of vertex and detour distance between a pair of vertex coincide if and only if the graph is a tree. She, S. Gupta have introduced the extended distance sum, which is defined as psi of g as the summation of the product of two terms, that is the distance between a pair of vertex and the sum of the eccentricities of that vertices. We extended this notion in the paper quoted below, and we defined it as the detour eccentric sum, which is the summation of the product of the detour distance between the pair of vertex and the sum of the detour eccentricities of those vertices. These are some preliminary results which we have already obtained. The detour eccentric sum is bounded below by n into n minus 1 for a connected graph of order n and bounded above by n into n minus 1, the whole cube. A Hamilton connected graph is a gra graph where every pair of vertices is connected by a Hamiltonian path. So the detour distance between any pair of vertices in a Hamilton connected graph will be n minus 1 which is the maximum detour distance between a pair of vertices in a graph. So the upper bound is attained by a Hamilton connected graph of order n greater than or equal to three. Same way, the minimum of the detour distance between a pair of vertex is one. So the lower bound is attained by any connected graph of order two. We also have established the detour eccentric sum of a cycle. Uh, when the cycle is an, of order e, of even order, the detour eccentric sum is 1 by 4 n square into n minus 1 into 3 n minus 4. And when the cycle is of odd order, it is 1 by 4 n into 3 n minus 1 into n minus 1, the whole square. Now, in this article, we have found the detour eccentric sum of some graphs which have at least one cycle and uh, which is obtained from the cycle Cn. So first we consider the sunlight graph, which is obtained from Cn by attaching one pendant edge to every vertex on the cycle. And for a sunlight graph of even order, the detour eccentric sum is 3n cube into n plus half minus n into n plus two. And if n is odd, 
the detour eccentric sum is 3n into n cube plus n square by 2 minus 1 by 2. A Helm graph is obtained from a wheel graph by attaching one pendant edge to every vertex on the rim of the cycle. And the graph invariant for this Helm graph is 2n cube into 2n plus 5 plus n into 6n minus 1. We obtain for a flower graph, which is um, the flower graph is obtained from Helm by joining each pendant vertex to the central vertex of the Helm. And for this flower graph, the detour eccentric sum is obtained as 4n cube into n plus 7 plus 3n into 15n minus 4. We consider another graph, gear graph, which is obtained by subdividing the edges on the rim of a wheel graph Wn. And for gear graph, the detour sum is n into 16n cube minus 4n square plus 3n minus 1. A sunflower graph is obtained from a gear graph by joining the vertices in Gn, which are adjacent to the hub of the gear graph. And here the ditto sum is 4n minus 1 into 4n cube plus n minus n square. Now we consider a graph which is obtained by subdividing the spokes of a wheel and we denote it as Wn star and the ditto sum is 4n cube into n plus 7 plus 3n into 15n minus 4. And we see that this, the detour sum coincides with the detour sum of a flower graph. Next, we consider a generalized friendship graph. Consider Hamilton connected graph H, which is of order M. And if N copies of H is amalgamated at a particular vertex U, we get a generalized friendship graph. And the detour eccentric sum is obtained as m into n minus 1, the whole cube, into 2n minus 1 plus 4 into m minus 1 into n minus 1. Now, in this, if we consider if we consider a Hamilton connected graph of order 3, like m is equal to 3, we get the friendship graph. The Hamilton connected graph will become a k3. So this becomes n copies of k3, amalgamation of n copies of k3, which is a friendship graph. And hence it is 18 into 18 minus 3. Now the scope of this study is to investigate the detour sum for several other graph classes. We can compare this topological index with certain other topological indices. We can characterize the non-isomorphic graphs having the same detour eccentric sum as I mentioned before. For two non-isomorphic graphs, the detour eccentric sum coincides. Ex and we can explore the potential use in chemical graph theory by studying the correlation with any physical properties of compounds. And these are the few of the references. Thank you. Any queries? Okay, thank you, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Can I stop sharing, ma'am? Please uh, C07 percent. This is Prabodha Sumanta Kumar Singh. Okay, so we move on to C08 Mangal. Okay, madam. Uh, should I start? Please share the screen. Okay. Is it visible? Okay, your uh, screen is visible, so your time starts now. Yes, ma'am. Sir, 
Doctor, sir. Amada, yes. Uh, is it visible? Yes, it is visible. Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. Myself is Mangal Solone. Screen is visible, madam? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You can continue. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Myself is Mangal Solone. I am from Akola, Maharashtra. Uh, I am working as an assistant teacher in uh, Bikam Chand Khandelwal uh, since uh, last 21 years. So today I am uh, presenting my paper on analysis of brain arteries using persistent homology tools and machine learning techniques uh, in topological data analysis. So first of all, uh, we must know what is topology. The topology is a study of surfaces. It is a study of con uh, continuity, connectivity. Uh, the history of uh, topology we can see uh, in Konigsberg, uh, Euler, great mathematician, he started working on graph theory. And uh, after that graph theory, a uh, new subject uh, was introduced, that is topology. Uh, what to expect from topology? The topology uh, studies not, not only uh, surfaces, but connectivity of uh, different planes, surfaces. From topology, uh, there is a branch, topological data analysis. It, uh, you, it is used to study complex high data, dimensional data, which is used for feature selection, uh, extracting shapes of data. We know data has shape and shape has meaning. So to study data, patterns of data, uh, to extract the shapes of data, we use topological data analysis. And very important, qualitative information is needed. Uh, summaries are more valuable than individual parameter. So, topological data analysis is a combination of algebraic topology, computer science, and statistics. It is a branch of applied mathematics that uses notions, uh, techniques of miscellaneous set of scientific fields. Uh, such as uh, you can see from the figure, algebraic topology, computer science stats. Its resulting tool allow to infer robust features about the shape of complex data sets potentially corrupted by noise or incompleteness. So what do we think if we heard the word data? Big data has been the most overpraised concept in recent years. Big data is defined as the data which is massive in size and expands rapidly over time. Dealing with the huge data, it's not difficult only because of its magnitude. Another issue that leads to big data, confusion is the complexity of the data. It is difficult to do data analysis, feature extraction, and other tasks on such data. This is one instance when data science will come in handy. To complete this assignment successfully, we must have a solid understanding of numerous mathematical and statistical approaches. Here, we shall look at how topology may be used in data analysis and machine learning. Big data, uh, how, how we are going to use this big data. So there is analogy, a group of data that is called node. Each node have relationship that we call it edge. We can, we can see structured massive number. We have network and shape. Shape of network represents shape of data. We identify the feature in the network which correspond with data. And we extract the knowledge of data. The very basic concept in topological data analysis is simplex. So simplex is the plural of simplices or simplices. It is an expansion of the concept of triangle or tetrahedron to, to arbitrary dimensions in geometry. The simplex gets its name from the being the simplest possible polytope form using line segments in any given dimension. A point is zero complex. Sorry, zero simplex. Its boundary is the empty set, implying it does not exist. A segment is a one simplex. It has two points as its boundary. A triangle is a, a segment is one simplex. You can see in the figure. Uh, triangle is a two simplex. Its uh, border is made up of three segments, each of two points as a boundary. And here, uh, three simplex tetrahedron. What is simplicial complex? So in the figure, you can see uh, more simplices connect to form simplicial complex. It is a discrete form, key information of a topological space. They have been used in mathematics to introduce combinatorial and discrete tools 
and uh, in geometry and topology. They represent topological space as a collection of simple elements uh, such as vertices, edges, triangles, tetrahedral, and more general synthesis. They are glued to each other as a, in a structured manner. In the last 20 years, they have been a basic tool in computer visualization and topological data analysis. Topological data analysis has been mainly as a quantitative method, the problem being this lack of proper tools to perform effective statistical analysis. What is homology? Homology group provide an algebraic way to model topological features of space, like, uh, like connected components, independent cycles, voids, or higher dimensional bubbles. But it seems that its power is a little limited. Example, we cannot differentiate between donut and coffee mug. It focuses on only connectivity and ignored the other information. Even we say topology is induced by matrix space. Persistent homology. So we must know what is persistent homology. Uh, Betty numbers, persistent diagrams, and algorithms for persistent homology. So, uh, before that, I'm going to uh, show you figure of vectorial series complex uh, and its Betty numbers, its persistent diagram. Persistent homology. It, homology of any space records how many holes are there, how many holes are in space in each dimension. Zero dimensional hole means one uh, that is connected component. One dimensional hole means loop and two-dimensional hole is vacuum surrounded by surface, such as sphere or torus and so on. When given a filter, an expanding sequence of spaces, homology becomes permanent. Each hole is now represented by a bar with the start or end point correspond to the first or final step in the filtering where the topological characteristics is present. Brief bars represent features with short lines that are quickly filled in once they are generated. Longer bars, on the other hand, correlate to more persistent features. These are persistent barcodes, you can see. For epsilon, as epsilon increases, we can see different, different uh, simplicial complex and its bar diagrams are represented. What are Betty numbers? The Betty numbers is an uh, important part of this topological data analysis, which measures the number of k-dimensional holes in an object. Zero-dimensional Betty number means number of connected components, that Betty, Betty zero, Betty one, that is uh, number of circle, topological circles, and Betty two, number of trap volumes. The point, you can see point has uh, beta 0 is 1, uh, beta 1 is 0, beta 2 is uh, 0. Uh, circle, beta numbers of circles are uh, can be uh, uh, seen here. Sphere, beta numbers of sphere, we can see here. And uh, beta numbers of torus, where we can see here. So we can find out easily. Now, important part that I'm going to work here. What is brain artery? Uh, brain artery is uh, nothing but, it is an... Uh, part of brain okay which are through which uh, blood blood flows blood vessels large blood vessel vessels that we call arteries and changes in the network of blood it is called vasculature and frequently the earliest indicators of illness development such as cancer and stroke if we can develop strategies for uh, detecting detecting these changes we will be better to able to treat these disorders and to create preventive medicines uh, very important is okay, topological data analysis is very useful in the healthcare system. The study of vasculature of brain is critical in predicting stroke and brain cancer. It is a very important part. And brain vasculature changes with age, and it is critical to be able to recognize and measure such change. The methodology I have explained here. Uh, the method important part is the uh, topological data analysis. Uh, it is a relatively new approach which extracts numerical properties from point clouds and quantify their form. A point cloud can include several related components such as loops, voids, and so on. 3D methods may be used to extract all of these unusual structures is a uh, works major methodological focus on topological data analysis. This relatively new approach extracts numerical properties uh, from point clouds that quantify their form. A point cloud can include several related components such as loops, voids, and so on. 3D methods may be used to extract all of these uh, unusual structures. Geo2 TDA uh, is a machine learning and data expression topological data analysis toolkit that we are going to use here. Uh, this is the pipeline. Uh, first, we are going to input the data in uh, either function form, point cloud form, digital image, matrix, editor. I'm going to use here a digital image uh, in uh, 3D, 3D form. Simplicial complex, we are going to find vitreous strips complex and check complex. Then we are going to convert them into barcode and persistent diagram uh, using uh, Goody software, Ripster software. Okay. 
then uh, feature selection and kernel distance. So we are going to find persistent Betty number, landscape, surface uh, persistent image, modeling distance, water strain distance, and kernels. Madam, it is audible. Ah, uh, your uh, ten minutes has taken over. The problem is there. Is that? Okay. Yes. Ah, uh, your ah, uh, can you continue? Yes. Ah, uh, then uh, unsupervised learning and supervised learning we are going to use. That is a part of machine learning. The clustering, ah, uh, different algorithms we can see here. Support vector machines, CNN, KNN, live eyes. Uh, machine learning. It is a notion behind machine learning that is a system can learn from data. It recognizes patterns and make decisions with minimal human participation. This is the scientific data of algorithms and statistical models that enable computer system to do certain tasks without the need of instruction, inference, or patterns. Machine learning algorithms generate a mathematical model based on sample data before making conclusion. Machine learning data and data exploration using TDA toolkit. Uh, uh, the Goody library we are going to use here. Research library is there. Fat library we, uh, we are going to we can use. Defa is also another uh, software for uh, calculating persistent homology uh, for finding a uh, algorithm very easily. Then another is Scikit TDA. Uh, it is also Python library we can use to find persistent diagram visualization. We can use uh, Matthew Carrier's uh, Skill Learn TDA Python package. Uh, there is also another topolayer Python module we can use. Uh, we can use also here a uh, header package for finding persistent diagrams. These are different uh, toolkits for uh, uh, calculating for finding persistent homology, persistent diagrams, kernels. And very important that uh, I'm going to use, I'm interested in uh, using Geo2 TDA. It is a toolkit for exploring braille arteries. It is extensively used for investigating, displaying, computing, and translating persistent diagrams. Uh, so please can, come yes, just uh, last slide, madam. Uh, we can use 3D images, three dimensional magnetic resonance angiography. Then, persistent homology, we are going to uh, find by using this Geo2 Geo TDA software. Then, persistent homology, uh, scatter plot, you can see here birth and death rate can be found out by using this Geo2 TDA software. And, uh, result. Uh, we have used here random forest classifier. Uh, by using this uh, U2 TD software, we can uh, find out the relationship between brain arteries and age. We can find out the relation. Okay, older brain and younger brain. We can distinguish uh, by using this topological data analysis field. And this is a conclusion. Uh, we can get fascinating data uh, between brain artery and age. We can create help helpful classification model. Uh, we can find out artery length, brain artery length, and uh, it is very effective to, uh, to find the age of the brain of healthy people. Uh, we can uh, due to it is very crucial for this uh, research. Okay, thank you, madam. Thank you, sir. Any queries? Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you, madam. We move on to the next presentation, C14, Sindhu Matthew P. Yes, ma'am. Okay, ma'am, you are audible. Uh, so please share the screen. Mangal sir, can you just stop sharing your screen? So, ma'am, you can share your screen. Hope it is visible. Okay, ma'am, visible. So, your time starts now. Good evening. I am Sindhu Mathu P. I have done this work under the supervision of my research supervisor, Dr. Vishwanath C. Narayanan. Department of Mathematics, Government Engineering College, Trishu. 
the paper I present here is about the process with temporary growth halts and population independent death rate. This paper presents a finite state space birth death process where the death rate is independent of population size. It is assumed that the birth process is subject to temporary halts and resumptions thereafter. An explicit steady state distribution of the above process is obtained. Dependence of the average population size on various system parameters is studied numerically. Resistance to apoptosis, a type of cell death in which a series of molecular steps in a cell leads to its death was recognized as an important trait of cancer cells. Many physicians and scientists working in oncology believe that for the tumors to arise, it is essential to acquire the ability of resisting apoptosis. Wang and others questions this belief saying no organism can live forever, neither can cancer cells. According to them, cancers usually have a significantly increased frequency of apoptosis. They propose a theory which says that Apoptosis drives cancer cell proliferation and metastasis. We model tumor progression using birth death process, incorporating the above two theories. Tumor cells resisting apoptosis would mean that the death rate is zero, while that undergoing apoptosis will, would mean that the death rate depends on population size k. Here we assume that the death rate is mu, somewhere between the above two theories. Taking into account environmental resistance, it may be that the growth is slowed down or even experienced temporary halts. We suspect this could be the case with some slowly growing tumors. Hence, we propose a birth death model where population growth is, effect, growth is affected by the environment. We also assume that the population does not grow beyond size n. We consider a birth death process X of T, N of T, E of T, T greater than or equal to zero, where N of T denote population size and E of T, the environment status. E of T is zero when both birth and death occurs and one when only birth death occurs. The state space of X of T is given by S. The transition rates is, are as follows. When N of T is zero, birth occurs at rate lambda naught. And when n of t is equal to n, birth occurs at rate lam n lambda and death at rate mu. The process may remain in environment zero or one for random times, exponentially distributed with rates delta one and delta two respectively. Then the infinitesimal generator matrix Q of the process X of t will be as follows, with the submatrices given as below. To study the steady state distribution, we take pi is equal to pi naught pi one, et cetera, pi s, the steady state probability distribution, then pi q will be zero. And this give rise to the following system of equations. And from the first equation, equation three, we get pi naught is equal to minus q minus mu pi one a one zero inverse. And on substitution in subsequent equations, we will get pi i is equal to minus mu pi i plus one a one i tilde inverse for i is equal to one to etc n minus one where the matrix a one i tilde is the two by two matrix minus i lambda minus delta one delta one mu plus delta two minus mu minus delta two and from the last equation we can get an expression for pi n s c into mu plus delta two divided by mu plus delta one plus delta two, delta one divided by mu plus delta one plus delta two. Substituting this backward recursively, we get the steady state probabilities pi n minus one, et cetera, up to pi naught. Using the normalization condition pi e equal to one, we find the constant C involved. Now, the average population size in steady state will be given by En is equal to sigma i pi i e, and the probability that the population size is not zero as sigma i is equal to one to n pi i e. Coming to the expected time for the population size to reach the maximum level, we consider a Markov chain x tilde t with an absorbing state star and the state space given by s delta as below. Then the generator matrix will take the form t t not zero zero where t is the matrix a one zero a zero zero etc. And t not is minus t. 
the then the time for the process x tilde t to reach the absor absorption state follows phase type distribution with representation alpha t where alpha is the initial probability vector the average time for the population to grow up to the absorption state star is t max is equal to minus alpha t inverse e we take beta is equal to minus alpha t inverse e this will give rise to the equations uh, beta t equal to minus alpha taking the initial vector with alpha not is equal to 1 0 we can get the reference relation uh, in beta i says beta i is equal to minus alpha naught plus mu beta i plus 1 into a 1 i tilde inverse as an equation 14 for i is equal to 1 to n minus 1. And from the last equation, we get an explicit expression for beta n minus 1 as 1 by n minus 1 lambda delta 2 plus mu, mu plus delta 2 delta 1. And the backward substitution again gives the values of beta i for i is equal to n minus 2 to 0. And from this, we can find the expected uh, time to reach the maximum level L or the absorption state as T max is equal to beta E, where E stands for the column of ones. Now we come to the transient probabilities of this distribution. The pr uh, transient probability P of T is obtained as P0 into exponential QT, where P0 is the initial probability vector. And uh, considering the large dimension, we use uniformization method to find the transition prop, find the probability P of T, the transition probability matrix of the uniformized discrete time Markov chain will be PI, P given by PIG as below where gamma stands for maximum of mode QIG. Starting from the probability distribution, P0 is equal to 1, 0, 0, et cetera, 0. The probability vector is obtained as, at time t is obtained as, P of t is equal to sigma n equal to 0 to infinity, P0, P raised to n, E raised to n is gamma t, gamma t raised to n divided by n factorial. And partitioning P of t as P0, t, p, et cetera, p and t, the average population size in the transient time t is given by en of t is equal to sigma i is equal to 0 to n i into pi, pi of t into e. We have done some numerical study of this, these results. As the death rate is independent of population size and the birth rate depends on population, one would expect that the population will grow up to maximum size, but this is not the case. We can see that when lambda is equal to 0 0.1 and mu is equal to 0.9, the expected population size and steady state is only 8.8408. An increase in the value of the environmental parameter delta 2 increases it to 98.99. And an increase in the parameter delta 1 uh, decreases the value to 0 0.1814. Now, the expected time to reach the maximum level n starting from level zero is obtained in this table. And here also it shows a similar pattern. When delta O2 is more, the growth is, <clears throat> the time taken is uh, smaller, that is the growth is uh, faster. And when delta O1 is small, it shows slower growth. Now we have the transient analysis, the population size at arbitrary time t. And in this case, uh, we can see that uh, when delta 1 and delta 2 are equal, um, the population grows in this pattern. And when delta 2 is more, the population grows faster than this. And when delta 1 is more, it takes a smaller growth. This is, <coughs> now, we compare this with some existing models. We compare it with the classic birth death models without any environment parameters. And the alternate birth death model pr proposed by Danuna. And we can see that the growth pattern in the current model is, uh, or the growth, growth is slower in the uh, current model than the previous two models, which makes it suitable for slowly, slowly growing tumors. Conclusion, we studied a birth death process with population independent death rate 
with temporary halt for growth. The process is studied by truncating at a finite level. It is observed that the change in environment has noticeable effect in the population growth. This model seems to be more suitable for slow population growth than the existing birth death models. In the present model, it is assumed that the death occur without any stopping. A possible extension is to assume a possibility where death stops, but birth continues. And the another possibility is in which both birth and death stops. Here are some references. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Any queries? Thank you, ma'am. You can stop sharing your screen. Next participant, C15, Shreta. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Mom, is my screen visible, ma'am? Yes, the screen is visible. Your time starts now. Yes, ma'am. So, good evening to one of the present here. I am Shweta for general scholar and doing my research work under the guidance of Dr. S. Sindhu Devi. And we are from SRM Institute of Science and Technology, Ramapuram campus. The presentation is about the mathematical model for diabetics using fuzzy parameters. So talking about uh, the paper, this paper provides us a small linear the differential equations model dynamics. Find the analytical solution, the Yes, ma'am, I'm able to hear you, ma'am. Um, can you hear me, ma'am? Yes, yes. So, shall I continue, ma'am? Yes, you can continue. Yes, ma'am. So, this is 
Can you see my slides? Yes, ma'am. It is visible now. Okay. Okay, ma'am. So your uh, time starts now. Slide view, everyone. Kind of. Yes, ma'am, it is visible. You can start. Ma'am. Okay, one second. Now it is gone. Can you share it once more? Yes, now we can see the slide. Okay, one second. You can put on the slideshow. Okay, okay, ma'am. I can't be able to take the slide. Sure. Ma'am, I think it is a blog. Uh, you can, uh, we can see the slides, but you may not put the slide show. Can you move to the second slide? Uh, so you can uh, present uh, by this itself. Can you not put on the slide show? You can start. Okay, thank you. Good evening, all. I am Shiny KS, research scholar under the guidance of Dr. Vishwanath C. Narayanan, Government Engineering College, Trishu. Now I present my paper, Study of Birth Death Process with Growth Interruptions. We consider birth death process with temporary birth halts, a stability condition under which population size remains finite with probability one is obtained. An explicit expression has been 
obtained for the steady state distribution of the process. We also studied a truncated version of the above process, which might have potential applications in several several fields such as tumor progression modeling and energy harvesting modeling. An explicit steady state distribution is obtained for the truncated process. Dependence of the average steady state population size on various modeling parameters is studied numerically for finite and infinite processes. Birth death models are widely used to model many real world problems in diverse fields such as biology and internet of things. One common thing that may occur in these models is the slowdown or stoppage of the birth or growth process. For example, according to Baba and Katoi, purely vascularized tumors slow down their development or even stop growing. Consider an IoT device which harvests power from sun or wind. It may happen that the harvesting of energy may stop temporarily and then resume with change in the weather. Motivated by the above facts, we study a birth death process where the birth process is subject to temporary interruptions and resumptions thereafter. Consider a Markov chain X of t is equal to n of t, s of t, t greater than or equal to zero, where n of t is the population size and s of t is defined as zero when both birth and death can occur and when only death can occur. The state space of the Markov chain is 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, etc. The birth and death rates are when n of t equal to zero, a birth may occur at rate lambda naught. And when n of t equal to n, a birth may occur at rate n lambda and a death may occur at rate n mu. The change in population size may also depend on the status of S of t. It may remain at 0, 1, 1 for random times, which are exponentially distributed with rates delta 1 and delta 2 respectively. Thus, the infinitesimal generator of the process X of t is given by Q, and the submatrices A1 naught, A0 naught are given as below. Next, we discuss the stability and steady state distribution. Let the steady state of the X of t is partitioned as pi equal to pi naught, pi 1, pi 2, etc. And the steady state equations are then given by pi naught a1 naught plus pi 1 a2 1 equal to 0 and pi i minus 1 a naught i minus 1 plus pi a a1 i plus pi i plus 1 a2 i plus 1 equal to 0 for all i greater than or equal to 1. From equation 3, we have pi naught is minus pi 1 a2 1 a1 naught inverse and substitute pi naught in equation 6, we get pi 1 a11 tilde plus pi 2 a22 is equal to 0. And because minus a21 a10 inverse a naught naught is mu 0, mu 0. Uh, so in general, we have pi a is equal to minus pi i plus 1 into a2 i plus 1 a i i tilde whole inverse, where a i tilde is given below. Now we consider the truncated version of the process X of t, in which it is assumed that no bugs happen beyond the level n. In this case, we will have a finite number of probabilities given by pi naught, pi 1, etc., pi n, which satisfies equation 10. From the normalizing condition, pi is equal to 1, the probabilities pi, pi a can be computed explicitly, but equation 10 cannot be applied for finding the steady state distribution of the infinite system because pi n tends to zero as n tends to infinity under the stability condition. In the infinite case, we adopt the following method for finding pi. Let pi a is equal to pi naught r1, r2, etc. ri for i greater than or equal to 1, where the ri matrices satisfies the system of equations a naught i minus 1 plus ri into a1 i plus ri ri plus 1 a2 i plus 1 equal to 0. From the structure of a naught i matrices, the ri matrices have the form a i b i 0 0. Hence, equation 11 gives rise to the following equations which are given in 13 and 14. Multiply equation 11 on its right with column vectors of 1s and make use of equation 10 we have a1 plus b1 is lambda naught by mu and ai plus ba equal to i minus 1 lambda by i mu for all i greater than or equal to 2. This reduces the system of equations 13 and 40 into 17 and 18. To solve for ais, it is reasonable to assume that under the stability condition, an is equal to an plus 1 for large n, which gives an square into n plus 1 mu minus an into n lambda plus n mu plus delta 1 plus delta 2 plus n minus 1 lambda by n mu into delta 2 plus n minus 1 lambda equal to 0. As n tends to infinity, 
it is the above equation becomes a n square minus a n into one plus lambda by mu plus lambda by mu equal to zero. From that we get limit n tends to infinity a n is equal to lambda by mu. The a necessary and sufficient condition for the stability is lambda by mu less than one. To compute the steady state distribution, we take a n is equal to lambda by mu for sufficiently large n and compute a one a two etc a n minus one recursively using equation seventy nine eighty. Next to be Calculate pi naught. Pi naught satisfies the equation a one naught plus r one a two one equal to zero. Let pi naught tilde be the stationary distribution of the Markov chain with infinitesimal generator matrix given by q one in equation twenty three. Solving pi naught tilde q one equal to zero and pi naught naught tilde plus pi naught one tilde equal to one, we get pi naught one as in twenty five and pi naught naught tilde in terms of pi naught one tilde. And pi naught is equal to c pi naught tilde, where c is a constant which is obtained from the normalizing condition pi is equal to one. Next, we discuss the steady state performance measures. Uh, average population size, expectation of x of t equal to sigma i pi i. Probability that population size is zero, p naught is equal to pi naught. Probability that population size greater than zero, that p a is Equal to one minus p naught. Probability that growth is interrupted p in t is equal to sigma e equal to zero to infinity pi a into zero one. Next, we discuss the time for the population to grow up to n. In this case, we truncated the state space into i zero, i one for zero less than or equal to less than or equal to n minus one union star where star is an absorbing state, which denotes the population size reaching the size n. For this x tilde of t denote the truncated version of x of t whose infin infinitesimal generator matrix q tilde is equal to q cap q not cap and q cap is given in twenty eight and q not cap is equal to minus q cap e. The time for the population size to reach n follows space type distribution with representation alpha q cap where alpha is one zero zero. Etc. Zero. The average time for population size to reach n e time is equal to minus alpha into q cap inverse into e. Let alpha q cap inverse is beta and beta is beta not beta one etc. Beta n minus one and alpha is alpha not alpha one etc. Alpha n minus one. Where alpha is alpha not is one zero and alpha equal to zero for all i greater than or equal to zero. From that we get a generalized condition. Beta is equal to minus. Alpha not into a i tilde inverse minus beta i plus one into a two i plus one into a i i tilde the whole inverse for one less than or equal to i less than or equal to n minus two. From the last equation, we get beta n minus one in an explicit form, and e time the average time for population size to reach n is sigma e equal to zero to n minus one beta n minus one. The numerical experimentation. We compared the birth death model with the temporary growth hulls with the classical birth death process in which immigration is allowed only when the population size is zero, and the alternating birth death process. The comparison was done based on the three performances, namely e time, expectation of x of t, and p a. Table one is the effect of lambda on mu on e time. Table one shows that e time is highest in the case of model three. And lowest in the case of model one for every lambda and mu considered. This could be the contribution of temporary growth interruptions in model two and model three because of the same reason. Increment in time e time with increment in mu for a fixed lambda is the highest in the case of model three. Hence, model three may be more useful in modeling the growth of certain type. Of tumors and in modeling the energy level in certain devices, in which energy harvest may experience hindrance due to different reasons. Table two is the effect of lambda and mu in expectation of x of t. Table two suggests that average population size is maximum for model one and minimum for model three. The rate of decrease in expectation of x of t with increase in mu for a fixed lambda is highest in the case of model three. This is again a contribution of growth interruption. In the case of model two, though there is a birth interruption, there is also an interruption in death. Also, this again indicates that model three may give more realistic picture in certain situations where the population size decreases more rapidly.
table 3 is the effect of lambda and mu on pa table 3 gives similar conclusions about the probability pa as in the case of expectation of x of t this probability is lowest in the case of model 3 notice that there is not much differences in model 1 and model 2 as far as pa is considered this can again be seen to be a contribution of the continuity in the death process in model 3 compared to model 2 Conclusions. We studied a birth death process where the birth process may experience temporary halts while the death process continues without any hindrance. An explicit steady state distribution is obtained under the stability condition. Several system performance measures are derived. A numerical study of the above measures indicates that the present model has some unique characteristics when compared to some of the closely related models. In the present model, it is assumed that deaths occur without any stopping. A possible extension seems to assume a possibility where death stops but birth continues and another possibility in which both birth and death stops. In the present study, we conducted only the steady state analysis. It will be interesting to study the transient development of the process. These are my references. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Any queries? Okay, thank you, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Three one seven, Anthana. Yes, ma'am. Are you ready to share? Yes, ma'am. Is it visible, ma'am? Yes, it is visible. So you can start now. Hello, everyone. Good evening. I am Arthana from Calicut. I completed my master's in mathematics from Calicut University. I completed my paper with the guidance of Dr. Jasmine Matthew. Today, I am going to share about a study on graphing sequential games. This paper covers graph di game diagram, game tree and its representation, and uh, a symbol graph of a tree diagram of sequential game and game tree of tic-tac-toe and me. Graph theory has many applications in the field of social science, science, engineering, and in operation research. Game theory is a important area in operation research. Modeling of game using graphs is special interest to many researchers. Directed graph is used to represent the moment or act in a game. In a sequential game, the players know each other's moment and act sequentially. That is, first player act and second player knows uh, the first player's moment or act, then second player plays and so on. Excuse me, ma'am. Yes. Uh, your presentation is showing the first slide itself. Sorry, ma'am, I can't hear. Your presentation is just showing the first slide only. Ma'am, is it visible now? It is not visible. You haven't shared. Is it visible now, ma'am? Yes, yes. Okay, ma'am. On slide show. Okay, and now we are just uh, showing the third slide. Okay, ma'am. 
let's look into the literature we can use scholarly literature on graph theory by a first look into graph theory by clark and holton and game theory by mac kinsey's an introduction to theory of games we can get enough information about application of graph theory from the text graph theory applications by poles mithil presented the concept of graph for linear programming problem manjula presented the application of graph theoretical tools in operation research in particular in game theory game diagram a diagram also called directed graph is a graph which the edges have a direction if u and v be two vertices a edge is represented by unordered pair uv and while in a diagram the edge is represented by ordered pair uv or vu a game diagram is a connected associated graph a diagram has unique vertices with zero degree is called the initial vertex which is the starting position of the game a diagram have more than one vertices with zero out of degree is corresponds to the closing position which is called the closing vertices a complete play of a game is directed path from starting position to the closing position game trick sequential games were represented by game trick it provides information about payoff strategies players and order of the move game trick consists of nodes uh, vertices at which the points players can take actions connected by edges which represent the actions that may be taken at that node an initial node or route represent the first decision to be made every edge of set from first node through tree eventually arrives at the terminal node representing the end of a game each terminal node is labeled by payoff each players if the game end at that node game tree representation the position of a, of the game is represented by vertices and the legal move between these positions are represented by edges starting position of the game and final position of the game are represented by root of a tree and uh, leaves of a tree respectively the vertices at even level are represented by boxes the vertices at odd level are represented by circles a value known as payoff or assigned at the work game terminates for a win loss game the win of first player is represented by a circle with one payoff and win by second player is represented by a box with minus one payoff for a game with a draw corresponding terminal vertices with a zero payoff characteristics of a game tree nodes and branches are two important components of a game tree nodes specify the player's position and label players whose turn is to move branches take us from one node to another a game tree uh, is is start with a single initial node connected by nodes connected by branches arrives at terminal node information set if a player uh, doesn't know his or her position in a game tree at the time of his or her uh, turn to move then two or more nodes are connected by dotted line called information set the given figure is an exam simple example of a two player game both players knows their outcome and others choice player a have two choices x and y player b has two choices u and b if player a choose x then player b have two choice u and b and for player b 6 is better than 0 so player b choose u if he choose y then player b have two choices u and b and for player b 5 is better than 
so b choose u anyway a knows uh, b's choice so for a 8 is better than 5 so a choose x b choose u and the payoff is 8 6 player a wins and b is helpless tic tac toe it is a sequential game tic tac toe notes and crosses or x or o c is a paper pencil for two player who turns making the spaces in a 3 by 3 grid with x or o c the player who successfully marks their three mark horizontally vertically or diagonally with win the game the given figure is a uh, game tree of tic tac toe nim nim is a mathematical game of strategy in which two players take turns removing object from distinct heaps or piles on each turn a player must remove at least one object or may remove any number of object provided they all come from the same heap or pile in a normal game uh, the winner is the one who take the last object i would like to conclude my today's presentation by summarizing the information a study of sequential game in graph study graph theory is studied graph theoretical tool is applied in game theory in particular in sequential game a connected acyclic graph is used to demonstrate a game example of sequential games uh, such as uh, tic tac toe and nim is demonstrator these are the some references Thank you. Anyone? Any queries? Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Three one five, Shweta. Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, yes. am I audible now, ma'am? Yes, you are audible. Any yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, um, uh, should I continue or uh, should I start from the beginning, ma'am? So you can start from the beginning because uh, you are not. Sure, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. So good evening. I am not present here. So I am Shweta. From uh, SRM Institute of Science and Technology, I'm a full-time research scholar. I'm doing my research work under the guidance of Dr. Yes Sindhu Devi, ma'am. So the topic of today is mathematical model for diabetics using fuzzy parameters. So the abstract of the paper is: the paper provides a system of non-linear fuzzy differential equation model for diabetics. We find the analytical solution using the homotopy perturbation method, and the stability of the system is investigated. Along with that, we have also investigated about the positivity and the boundedness, both analytically and graphically. The results shows that the disease the disease tends to die over a while of time. So here is the introduction part. The diabetes is one of the disease that can lead to person's death, and it has become a major health issue around the world. The severity of the condition causes serious health concerns, such as the nerve damage, limb loss. blindness kidney impairment and sexual function disorders diabetics can be caused by a variety of factors including gene social position and psychological issues so here are the few literature survey so first of all the stability of the diabetics for which they have chosen a fuzzy model and applied a generalized rokuhara derivative and few other authors have applied the sbc model which is susceptible diabetics complication model to predict the changes in diabetics prevalence in usa so the fuzzy model has been introduced by dr zadi here are the preliminaries for the paper uh, we have used the definitions like a fuzzy number a triangular fuzzy number so here is a model uh the diabetics has been classified into three categories they type 1 diabetics which is dependent on insulin type 2 diabetics which is independent on insulin and the gestational di diabetics which happens when the blood sugar level goes high for the pregnant women 
So there are uh, many authors who have discussed about the diabetics using different mathematical models. In this paper, we have constructed the S E I T model. So which is S stands for the susceptible, E as in the exposed uh, population, I for the infected population and T for the treatment population. So the infected population who takes, uh, who undergoes the treatment. So here is a mathematical model. So for this one, uh, the four compartment uh, is being divided and N is the total number of population. So sum of all the susceptible, exposed, infected and the treatment population adds up to the total number of population, which is capital N. So here are the description of the parameters as we have already discussed, N is the total population. So then we go, go in for the recruitment rate exposed to population, infected population, T as in for the infected population who undergoes treatment. And S as uh, already told it is susceptible population epsilon is a contact rate and beta is an infected rate, delta one is the rate of death due to the diabetics without the taking treatment and delta two is taken as the rate of uh, death due to diabetics with taking treatment. When they take the treatment, we consider that as delta two and delta one is without taking the treatment. So uh, the positivity and dominance, uh, the theorem has been given. For the first theorem, we have proved that um, uh, the taken model, the equation, so the, this equation is non-negative. We have proven that it is non-negative. So for that, we have uh, uh, subdivided into various cases. Say for the first one, we have taken as S is equal to zero when the susceptible condition is zero. Then we have concluded that it cannot exit the boundary which is taken. And similarly, for when the I is a zero, infected population is zero. We have taken two cases, say case one and case two, where the case one talks about when the exposed is zero and the infected is zero. And the case one talks about the exposed is greater than zero and I dash, which is DI by DT is greater than zero. So in this case, uh, also, the equation stays within the boundary limit. And for the next one, we have taken the t, t is equal to zero. That is when the treatment is zero. Here again, we have divided into two cases. That is when E is zero, automatically T dash is zero. And for case two, we have also proven that this lies within the boundary. On the whole, we conclude that uh, for the considered equation, the Equation lies within the boundary, so the equation is a non-negative equation. So to prove that, the next content is about talking about the boundedness. So boundedness is uh, the theorem two talks about the boundedness of the theorem, or sorry, of the equation. So we have proved the boundedness, and then stability of the stability analysis of the disease, which is diabetics. So there are two kinds of uh, equilibrium points which is taken one is a diabetic free equilibrium and other is the endemic equilibrium so for the diabetic free equilibrium we have uh, taken only when the susceptible population exists wherein the other cases other compartments like the exposed uh, compartment the infected compartment as well as the treatment compartment is taken as zero and that case we have taken the diabetic free equilibrium and we have given the point and for the endemic equilibrium, when all the compartment, all four compartment are considered, we have proven the, we have given the uh, endemic, free, endemic equilibrium point. We have also discussed about the numerical simulation. And here we have taken the initial value. So the susceptible, initially the susceptible value is taken as 377.896. Exposed is taken as 9.304. And the infected population is taken as 4.779. And the treatment, uh, the population who is undergoing the treatment is taken as 3.426. So using the homotopy perturbation method, we have... Uh, uh, calculated the values by taking these as an initial value and further we have uh, uh, the parameters are defalsified using the process called the graded mean integration method. There are many methods for the defalsification. We have opted for a graded mean integration method and here is a graph which shows a susceptible population. So from the graph it is very much clear that the susceptible population is decreasing. In this case we can suspect that the uh, the disease is being spread very fastly. So here is the exposed population. So exposed population are the population who are uh, about to get the disease 
and the, these are the infectious population who are very much sure the population uh, populations are sure that the disease has been affected and here is the treatment population after the disease is being infected for them the people who undergoes the treatment and here is the three category which is uh, which shows you uh, the exposed infected and the treatment population and here is the conclusion here we have discussed about the stability of the disease at the disease uh, free equilibrium point so in our paper we have considered at the diabetic free equilibrium point since our uh, disease is the diabetics we have considered as a diabetic free equilibrium point so it is found that uh, it is stable at that point the positivity and the boundedness of the model has been analyzed so using uh, the initial uh, values we have computed these all the graphs have been uh, computed only for 30 days and and then we have analyzed the dynamical behavior of sgit which is susceptible as exposed infected treatment epidemic model to minimize the infected population from the system so from the graph it is very much clear that the since the graph goes down it is clear that it goes till uh, towards the peak of the level and slowly the disease is being decreased so when it goes uh, nearer to 30 days uh, totally the disease is going to die out and the impact of other forms of control such as vaccination is not considered in our current research which solely considered the treatment controls however in future work we will incorporate the impacts of other controls such as vaccination controls so here are my few references thank you thank you ma'am are there any queries thank you ma'am thank you ma'am is the cc07 present is sujit begonda or sumanta kumar singh <clears throat> So the session is over. So uh, that is an important announcement. Uh, tomorrow the session will be starting. Uh, the contributory paper sessions five and six will be starting by eight fifty-five a.m. It was uh, not given in the schedule at this time. So please note that it will start by eight fifty-five a.m. So uh, day two of ICMI CTS twenty-two has uh, come to an end. Thank you, everyone.